Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul, and in this Shrew Gaming Silicon video, we're going to be discussing analysing tech news, which, as usual, popped up over the past 24 or so hours. We're going to be starting things out with Intel's Xeon E 1151 processors, which are based upon the Coffee Lake architecture. These are notable because they are eight cores, and these have actually been confirmed on Intel's own official webpage. So, of course, the Coffee Lake S has been rumoured to be moving to eight cores for some time now. Previously, the highest core count for Intel was found on the 8700K, which had six cores and 12 threads. But we're looking for this to be bolstered up to eight cores and 12 threads, which will be the highest uh, core count that Intel have produced, but of course we'll only put it on par with the AMD equivalents of the 1700X and more recently the 2700X. Intel are listing this 8-core Xeon E part as an ES, which of course means engineering sample, and it will be the V7 of the Xeon E lineup. This means, of course, it is the version 7, which replaces version 6, which has been around for some time now. So what can we ascertain from this? Well, it would appear that the Xeon variants of the 8-core processors will appear first, with the regular mainstream i7s or whatever they end up being called arriving a little later possibly in time with the z390 platform for those unfamiliar the z390 and z370 are very similar to one another but with a few updates here and there for my mind it'll be very curious how amd responds to the release of these cpus from what we understand, AMD have a pretty good profit margin with Zen, so it's possible they could simply reduce the price of the 2700X, or they could introduce the 2800X, and I don't think, once again, it's going to have additional cores. Almost certainly, we're just going to see higher clock speeds. It's going to be a better bin processor, essentially. So you can almost think of it in many ways as the Intel 8076K, which is pretty much an 8700K, just better bend and has higher clock speed. So we can probably presume about two to 300 megahertz on the 2800X. So once again, that will most likely be competing against the eight core Coffee Lake S when it's finally launched. But it is good that we are seeing these engineering samples because it does of course mean that we are getting ever closer to the release of these chips. Speaking of successor to Intel's chips, let's discuss a possible Ice Lake entry on the ashes of the Singularity benchmark database. So Ice Lake, if you're unfamiliar, is the successor to Canon Lake and is to be built on the 10NM process, but will feature the Intel 11th generation iGPU, which from what we understand is going to have 48 execution units. Back in mid-February of 2018, this year, we did actually see a Sysoft Sandra entry for an Ice Lake processor, but now, of course, this is backed up with Ashes Singularity. This means that Intel are most likely getting a lot closer to the final release of the silicon. In other words, the silicon is getting closer to production quality. Of course, it is on a 10NM process, so there is that also for them to take in consideration. And quite frankly, Intel's 10NM is a subject of another video in and of itself, so I don't really want to get bogged down with that in this video. But still, it's good news. Most likely we're looking at an entry here which is for the U segment, ultra low power, but still it features four cores and eight threads, which is pretty darn impressive. Yes, the scores are fairly low, but you have to remember that once again, it is not final silicon. So quite possibly there are bugs in the actual processor, which basically is really skewing the results. So what's the take home here? Well, if you were wondering suddenly, should you just wait on upgrading that processor? No. Um, Ice Lake is not scheduled for launch this year and most likely will be at some point next year. Of course, what we can say, however, is that the processor is at least getting to the stage where it's running code in a fairly meaningful way. I apologise for this being audio only, but I got this piece of news just after I'd finished recording on camera and I wanted to throw it in. But there have also been some benchmarks leaked for the Ryzen 7 2800H, which, as the name would denote, is a high-performance processor in notebooks. This model is yet to be officially announced by AMD, but, well, we've had a couple of leaks now concerning this very processor. The first was 3DMark where we saw that it had a base clock of 3400 MHz and a maximum turbo of 3347. Yeah, that doesn't seem to be quite right, does it? But it has eight threads, four cores, and is packaged alongside Vega 11, so that's 704 shaders. 
The key takeaway here is that the turbo frequencies are not known, but at least we know the base clock, unless of course these are improved with later revisions of the silicon. So the tests we have now are from Ashes of the Singularity, as so many seem to be. And we have frame rate and CPU frame rate. The CPU frame rate it's getting is around 52, or 51.8 if you want me to be precise, but that is only going to be a 35 watt part from what we can so far understand from the leaks. However, how does this compare to a desktop part that's say the 2200G? The website computerbase.de actually put together a small comparison and according to their results they're looking at 58 frames a second for the 2200G. So that's pretty damn good. I mean, once again, you're looking at a part that's essentially half the power consumption and scores fairly well. Most likely the key difference is going to be the thermal limitations of the form factor. Oh, and just as a small bonus, we also have a couple of details on the Ryzen 5 2600H. I had previously mentioned these, but I just want to quickly remind you, the Ryzen 5 2600H is still going to be 4 cores, it's still going to be 8 threads, but the clock speed of the base is going to be just a tiny bit lower, just a titch, just a jot, just an iota. Yes, I, I couldn't stop myself there, I apologise. It's going to run at just 3.3 GHz, but the main cut is in the GPU where it's just using a Vega 8 which means just 512 shaders total so obviously uh, performance is going to go down in kind. So one story which somewhat flew under the radar is the fact that certain AMD BIOSes will actually be dropping support for the Bristol Ridge series of APUs. One of the functions, of course, of a motherboard BIOS, or UEFI if you prefer, is to actually figure out what process you have installed inside your particular motherboard. When it does so, it figures out the configuration it needs, for example, the clock speed, voltages, and so on and so on. But according to the website Anantec, there are some issues. There are around 45 or perhaps even more processors on the AM4 platform, and this figure is only set to rise. In fact, from what we can figure out, it's going to be around 55 in the not too distant future. So, one of the issues that immediately comes to mind is that most motherboards, particularly of the cheaper end, use a single 128 MB, that's megabit or 16 megabyte BIOS chip, and this needs to contain all of the data and code for the system. So therefore, you're left with a couple of choices. The first is to drop support for Bristol Ridge, or the second is to increase the size of the BIOS chip itself to retain support. And given that that would increase the cost, well, I think you can see where I'm going with this. So, pretty much now, the sales figures for these CPUs is very low. In fact, Honestly, the main reason that someone might use one of these is if you wish to BIOS flash your motherboard to, say, support the latest Ryzen CPU. So you might buy one of these really cheap, plonk it into your motherboard, and then BIOS flash. Typically, it's not something that gamers are going to want to use, and it's something that not probably even content creators or someone building a low uh, power PC are going to use. But the real culprit here is 128 megabytes of storage that is found to hold the BIOS of a motherboard. So, of course, motherboards BIOSes have become considerably more complex over the past, say, several years in particular. But if you were to look at a BIOS of like the 90s and how it looked, pretty much like DOS incidentally, and compare it to one now where it's got a GUI, you've got mouse support, you can do everything from use a board explorer, you can of course flash the BIOS within the BIOS, which is, I guess, BIOS, Perception. I don't know, but you've got all of these different features and of course you have the ability to store multiple overclock states. It's basically a lot more fully functional, but on top of that you also have so many more processes which are being supported. So there's an issue, there is only a certain amount of space that you can store all of that information and guess what? They've pretty much gotten to the point now where they run out of that space. So most likely what's going to have to happen is that these uh, processors which are based on Bristol Ridge are going to have to move to legacy status when it comes to the motherboard. So in short, if you buy another motherboard, uh, let's say you have a processor based on Bristol Ridge and you upgrade and let's say your current motherboard breaks, 
then if you want to replace that motherboard and still keep the Bristol Ridge processor, you need to be kind of careful to make sure that that motherboard is actually going to support the CPU and it doesn't have a later BIOS, which would mean that your motherboard is not going to even boot. Is this a particularly big deal? No, honestly, excavator cores, which of course were found in the FX series of CPUs, are not going to be something that a lot of people are gonna be using now, but I did wanna bring it to your attention just in case you do have an older system and perhaps you want to relegate, uh, let's say you have a B350 board or something like that, and you have one of these older CPUs and you wanna plonk it in and let's say you're upgrading to a high-end Ryzen 2000 series C setup, then it is something that you might wanna know just in case you're wondering what, what, what for it, no poo. And while we're on the same subject of APUs, I also think it's worth discussing the fact that the Raven Ridge series of APUs, which of course are a combination of the technology of both Ryzen and Vega, have been stated to be only getting a driver update for the GPUs every three months. This is causing users to be a little upset. Obviously, updated drivers improve performance of the game and can also fix issues, for example, the game not booting or perhaps graphical glitches, you get the idea by now. And this is even made worse because the Kaby Lake G uh, series of processors, which of course features the Intel series of CPUs combined with AMD's Vega, has actually just received a more later driver update than what the AMD's own product has. The latest driver which is currently available for the Raven Ridge series of APUs is 18.5.1. Kaby Lake G, meanwhile, is 18.6.1. So obviously this can be somewhat upsetting to people and it could also somewhat hurt sales or at least taper your enthusiasm of buying one of these things because after all, one of the whole reasons that you want to buy a product is to know not only is it performing well, but you also want to make sure it's quite su well supported. AMD, according to a representative speaking over Clockers UK forum, has said that the reason they're doing this is to make sure that they are uh, putting more work into each of the driver revisions and that they're going to be, you know, bug free and they're going to perform the best they can and all that stuff. Personally, and I'm curious to hear your opinions on this, so do, you know, type them out in the comments section down below. But personally, I don't particularly like that. I think that AMD should move towards a unified driver situation, which they'd kind of hinted that they wanted to. And I think that if you see a graphics uh, card driver update for the regular Radeon, let's say the 580 or what have you, it should also be a push to the APUs as well, because, well, that's kind of what you would expect when you're buying the product. With all of that said, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on this and everything else that we've discussed today. So normal stuff, like, share, comment and subscribe. There's only a single video today because, well, I'm doing lots of work in the background, including uh, doing the initial stuff for the build video back there. Uh, I've got all the parts ready now, which is good. It's going to be based on an i7 because we have a uh, B360 motherboard, so we're just going to be putting that together for fun more than anything. And then, of course, it's going to be like a full review and testing. It's not a sponsored video, by the way. It's just something I've been kind of wanting to do anyway because for some reason or another, I've never put a build video together, so I just kind of felt like doing one. And there's a lot of other stuff. A couple of viewers have asked me to look at uh, the ray tracing discussion which Microsoft had. Um, so I'm going into that and some other bits and pieces as well. So definitely stick around now that we've cleared some of the back catalog from the Ryzen 2000 series, although we have one video remaining on that that I'm currently uh, finishing this script for. But once again, thanks to all the new subscribers. It means an awful lot. And well, hopefully you'll continue to stick around and enjoy the content. Bye for now.